Welcome to the week five post recording. This week is about pricing. Now, one of the things about services marketing pricing is that it is subjective. It is going to be heavily influenced by perception. The customer's perception of value, which is going to be influenced by promotion, which is going to be influenced by ServiceScape. There is a lot of cross wiring that comes into effect here. Also, price communicates value. So price in itself is also part of your integrated marketing communications. The price you charge has to be worth the value you're offering for the value you're offering to be perceived as the quality you think it should be. Which is why that question of everyone has a price, make yours worth it. Not everyone has a financial price. Everyone has some reason to do what they do. Everyone has some reward they take from every one of their actions. So everyone and everything has a price. You just gotta find the right value offer in order to make the transaction. So, welcome. What we're gonna do, it's gonna be a walk through some of the theory around service pricing, a bit of a discussion around value because Whilst there isn't a dedicated standalone chapter on the product, and that's because product in services is influenced by so many facets, it lays over the top of the rest of the mix. When we're talking about value and the creation of value in services marketing, we're talking about a product offer. But one of the things we're gonna talk about today is what constitutes value from a services perspective can also constitute the cost the sacrifice, the trade-off, and you can make those trade-offs better or worse to increase or decrease the level of value the customer expects. So there's a lot more complexity here than just simply rocking up um, some physical objects and putting them out for sale. Now during the class we ran with the but wait there's more exercise. Uh, this was based a little bit of improvise, uh, improv, a little bit of teaching people to take the unexpected and embrace it. And also a significant amount of the IHIP model. So during the workshop, the process was you drew a product, an unknown product. So start with uncertainty, perishability, inseparability. Then you got two features, one of which you got to choose. So you gained a little bit of control and one that was randomly allocated to you. You conceded a little bit of control. Because it was gonna be randomly allocated to you, you had no way of preparing yourself for predicting ahead of time. So even if we were to redo the workshop with those same set of cards over again, because a random draw takes place, there would be both the perishability and the inconsistency. Also, in this, what we asked was that your first round was just using the goods as they were physically, second round to start thinking of them as hybrids, third round to think of them as facilitators of service. Even though you had more experience at pitching a product by the third round, the third round was considerably harder because instead of being able to say, here are the tangible features of my goods, you had to work out what to do with them. So there was a bit of a challenge uh, in this exercise. It is quite, uh, it's one of these workshops where at the time you're probably going, I'm not sure why I'm doing it. I'm kind of having a bit of fun, but I'm not sure what its connection is. Here its connection very much is to, one, seeing that the value offer and the value composition is difficult. That where we get you thinking about, the, where we give you an object and its features, it's difficult to get your mindset around the value proposition. But if you come at something with a value proposition, it's going to be easier to assign it traits, attributes it must have to deliver that value. And also improv training, mind, skill, speed, it's always useful. Okay, a couple of things in the session. We want to make certain that we are looking at Understanding the difference between cost and price, and price and value. From an organizational side, we will we think about costs in terms of what does it 
What are the financial sacrifices the organisation needs to make in order to put a value offer to the market? When the market comes to buy your value offer, they will incur costs. But what is of interest to us is when we're thinking as marketers, what is it that the market is prepared to tolerate? What is it the market seeks from the value transaction? And do they want high, medium or low prices? Because there is a market demand for a high price, which if we don't reach it, if we don't recognize that in our market, we will cause dissatisfaction by lowering our prices. So let's talk about value. Co-creation says value is in the eye and skill set of the beholder. Service dominant logic says it's only in the eye of the beholder if you're using the beholder. And services marketing says, well, if the customer is present and it's a high contact service, then it makes sense. But otherwise, so the key things here is you want to have in your mind a little bit of separation between what it's going to cost you to make your product, which is a cost for you, versus what it's going to cost your customer, which is the price you're setting, versus what is the value the customer is going to get from your product. Now value is super important here because value is the core of the whole services marketing process. This is why, although there was a little bit of pushback from the audience, the start of the semester and all the way through, we've talked about offering that has value or the services marketing value offer because it's moving away from goods and services. It's moving away from the idea of the either the tangible or even the, the preset, the pre-specified, and into what is it the customer gets out of being part or party to the service delivery. Now, we'll come through value and cost a few more times, but basically uh, this whole idea of the offering that have value, there are value modifiers, as I'm calling them. You will pay more for a service that is closer when you need it. You'll pay for premiums for convenience, you'll pay premiums for speed, you'll pay premiums for quality. So there's a core value and there are modifiers to the value. But you also pay premiums because they give you a value, something, they give you something useful back. Uh, the value co-creation, there is a the required level of participation. What does it cost someone to use your product? in order to unlock the minimum viable value. So value in itself is a trade-off between the, what the customer has to sacrifice or forego in order to get the reward that's embedded within your product offer. So this is one of the key things about the modern value co-creation is that it's a trade-off. We can ask the customer to do incredibly expensive cost incurring events if they feel that the reward is worth it at the end. So some of the costs are listed on the screen here, financial price we're familiar with, it's the dollar value. But then there's also time price. How long does it take to unlock the value of the product? How much effort is required to unlock the value of the product? Sorry about this subject, it's very effort expensive. What sort of skill level is required? Well, if you're gonna unlock the full value of an assignment, there is a level of skill that you have to possess and display and demonstrate in order to get the most out of the assignment. It will cost you mental energy. What is the cognitive workout that you need to go through? Have you ever had that moment where you've gone to, you fired up YouTube and all you want is some mindless cat videos of pets doing funny things, cats chasing a laser pointer. You don't want to think. What you're looking for is low mental energy expenditure in your service. If you have these moments of, don't make me think, just let me enjoy the experience, you're looking for low cognitive, low mental energy. Now I'll also point out that there are other um, prices here in terms of psychological costs. Uh, and there are facets to a service 
that you have to take. Every time I ask someone to speak in class, I am making it a psychological cost. There is an expense. Every time I'm asking you to engage in certain activities in class, time, effort, skill, mental energy and psychological costs are coming up. So you're already used to dealing with costs. The mission critical part is to give those costs a benefit that outweighs them. So the value co-creation, unlocking benefits that exceed the costs. Now, the paper, the Woodall paper that's gone up onto the Waddle site, I came across this one because I got to see uh, Woodall presenting a paper on value and higher education at the British Academy of Marketing Conference in July this year. And their concept, like their paper also as a, as a marketing academic, this is a really good paper for understanding the complexity of our discipline. And also, yes, it's a little bit old now, but that's part of the fun of it, is that 15 years ago, this is how complicated value was. And that's 2003. Service dominant logic hasn't launched yet. So you think how complex it was before SDL hit the market. So this framework, this framework here, why it's important to you is that it's showing that there are multiple ways in which you can extract value from any given thing. In particular, the idea of there being what the value, what the transaction is worth in the exchange, an inherent value, which can be the, the worth of an object or the worth of a service, the use value, what do you get out of doing or having or consuming, a utilitarian value in terms of the financial and how does this fit you and your lifestyle plus an overall value statement so this whole thing is this amalgam it's not a single object it's a continuous and a continuum and also the idea that value is a combination not just of the sacrifice what you're prepared to give up what you receive but who you are as a consumer and what the market is doing, what the marketplace is telling you. So it's a complex thing. Value is complicated. If you struggle with it during the semester, that's okay. Look at this guy's paper, 2003. He wrote an enormously complicated paper and the following year, Service Dominant Logic came out and said, well, value is embedded in all things as a service. So if you think, you, I hate SDL, you wanna know what this guy's opinion would have been. Now, pricing, the sacrifices element. This is also because the fundamental philosophy of this course, embrace or mitigate. In this paper, Woodall talks about sacrifices. It's the only time I'm ever gonna be able to say human sacrifice is on my list of prices. It's human energy, but still it's a human sacrifice. You, know, you do see some of these things sort of look like they're overlapping a little bit in terms of costs and everything else, but this is what you're wanting to understand here is the different ways and means by which human consumers are going to look at a service and say, can I afford it? Can I afford it in terms of, can I pay the money for it? Is the market price that's being asked for it a fair rate? Say hello to surge pricing. What are the secondary costs? What are the costs of use? If I'm going to, um, I'm going to pick on my Anytime Fitness gym again. Uh, I'm paying my 30 bucks a fortnight for my gym. It will cost me two hours per day I train to train for 90 minutes. This is a 15 minute top and tail getting changed but it's also going to cost me the 20 minutes to get there and it's going to cost me the 20 minutes to get home and it's going to cost me the gym kit and it's going to cost me the as I start training and training more frequently it's going to also cost of use will come into the modifications to the diets the supplements suddenly there's $39 something 30 bucks a month 
is picking up on a heavy use week at an additional 30 bucks per fortnight, 20 hours, and I have no conception, but I'm going to say about $150 of additional food. That's if you're ordering those ready to meet, ready to eat gym meals. It's not thirty bucks. A, it's not thirty bucks a fortnight anymore. It's a lot more expensive. So pricing, total cost, total price. The idea of an overall overarching sense of what does the service take to consume it? What will you need to do in order to get value from your service? What do you have to pay? And that's excluding the fact that if I'm going to the gym to get my ten hours a week up, and I'm going and hitting the gym. Uh, four times a week, it's, it's split program legs on one night, back shoulders and chest on the other night, skipping core every night because everyone skips core. There's energy expenditure, there's coming out of the gym tired, there's the time I spent in the gym, there's also the effort. There's the cognitive, I have to think about how I'm training, what's my training goals, there's the psychological costs of oh god do I want to put myself through this I still don't know why every gym I've ever had a membership at is on the second floor with a staircase do they want us to skip legs day but then there are other elements here not just in cost of use there's things like the opportunity costs the two hours I spend at the gym are two hours that I'm not spending somewhere else and I frequently will trade off the ability to go and play Borderlands over going to the gym. But at the same time, I will trade off getting things done at work over playing Borderlands over going to the gym. So there are a whole bunch of non-financial and non-monetary costs that I will trade off in order to get the best out of my week. In the midst of all of this is just looking at all these things going, on one side they're sacrifices, on another side they're value offers in waiting. The psychological cost of doing an extreme sports event. Now I say this as someone who does live action role playing. The psychological cost of standing in a field in quasi medieval armour, hitting another and being hit by another with a um, rubberized sword that's a reasonably high price, except the return is phenomenal. I love it. But it takes time costs, it takes financial costs, it takes all these other elements in, but the psychological costs can be turned into a psychological feature. Yes, we are part of, you know, take CrossFit, take gyms, take extreme sports, take anything that sets you apart. The psychological cost is that you become part of a the other, you can become part of a group that's not part of the mainstream, that can be turned over into a benefit. It gives you an elite stash just within your own little circle community of people who are also participants in this area. The energy that you expend on something, the difficulty factor it creates can become a feature that you can sell. Even the monetary cost, a super expensive service is a signal that you are rich enough to afford it. So it can be a benefit to the customer. Price can be a signal of quality, but price can also be a signal of the individual and their sense of self-worth or the perceived worth in the eyes of others. Every sacrifice in this list can be embraced as a feature. So let's get into the pricing. Pricing is literally the hardest part of um, all marketing. It's the bit also in services marketing is the bit we do the most discounting on because we do subjective things and then go, yeah, look, I know I worked it out that my actual price is $175, but I'd really like to get the contract, so here's $75. You just cost yourself a hundred bucks. But your your assumption is that if you didn't drop it by that, you cost yourself $175. So there are challenges in this as well. There are psychological prices to psychological pricing. Now, I raised this uh, idea in the class. 
this is a one of the sort of discussion style questions that suits my examination formats quite well and it's this idea here that when you see the keyword in the sentence the keyword is discuss there's no right answer there are wrong answers by the way but there's no right answer there's no perfect answer what there is is the case that you mount now briefly uh, batting for both teams here if you were to argue for a case where prices should be set on the perceived value of the service an initial argument that I can raise is that where a service has an easily accessed reference price perceived value is a good use of the service pricing a high level search attributes people can make assumptions about the service prior to its use it can be semi pre experienced or semi demonstrated, or it's there's a certain level of routine, standardization, or familiarity, then perception of value is a good aspect because people will have a reasonable perceived view, will have a reasonable view of the service and will have a reasonable perception of what it's worth. The more the less heterogeneous it is, the less inconsistent it is, the more standardized value based pricing will apply. And also if you've got multiple competitors. There is a sense everyone knows what a certain price, everyone knows what a haircut's worth roughly, how much, what you'd expect for how long, and what a taxi fare's worth, and what. So there's a bunch of things where value-based pricing is going to work because people have got an assumption of value. The case against is where, and this is one of the cases, there are multiple cases by the way, I'm just picking the thing that you can argue either side. If you come into this and go, actually, no, perceived value is a terrible idea because the customer doesn't know what the price, doesn't know what the service is worth. A high credence attribute product where you're never sure whether you got good quality overall is a terrible place to try and go and get someone to price it based on what they thought the, the event was worth. Similarly, experience-based pricing is on the mid-card here is part of the way through the service when they are enjoying it the most is probably when they'd be willing to pay the most for it but you can't really interrupt them and say check please or pay up please halfway through an experiential service. Uh, I also think that, uh, I'd also argue that where you're looking at a high level of customization and there's high levels of variable costs that the organization wants to retain the ability to price based on what the product is costing. So you want a little bit of cost base uh, to be available to you so that you're not going to go broke because whilst the customer thinks, oh, that should be free, or that should be really cheap, or I think that's worth about 10 bucks, in reality it's costing you 150 bucks to do, so you should be pricing it around 200. Also products that are very early into the market where people don't know what something's worth or they haven't established a price for it yet. Value, but perceived value of the service makes it difficult. In the case four, perceived value can also be beneficial where you are price premium, you're going luxury pricing because the perception of the value drives the assumption of the quality and the assumption of the quality is driven by the price, which is a signal and social signifier of a high price indicates high quality, therefore our perceived value of the service is going to be quite high because they're charging quite a lot. The key by the way in this is the argument you mount, how you present it, the evidence you use, the argument you make. Now a quick thing on price segmentation, the reason why we absolutely hammer you about segmentation in services marketing is you can do differential pricing based on your service market segment. Two things required, you must be able to identify that segment, so you may have to know who they are, and you must be able to reach them independently of other segments. A third requirement is that you shouldn't be able to on-sell your ticket from the low price segment to the high price segment. Case in point is always going to be festivals, concerts, 
and ticketed events where scalpers will come in. Now, I made this argument in the class, I'm going to continue to make it. There is a segment of people who will pay $1,500 or more for tickets that are worth $70. So you should make that, you should give them the chance to live their dreams by selling $1,500 and $2,000 tickets. So they're going to pay the scalper 2K, you might as well get that 2K. Because they see a value in having spent that much money on that product. So the key to it is your segment's got to be responsive to your price offer. They've got to be identifiable. They've got to be targetable. And your variance in pricing shouldn't confuse your customer, shouldn't. If you are doing an ultra luxury price for the far too much money crowd, the stupidly rich, that shouldn't put off the main body of the audience who's going to pay a reasonable price for you. So your segmentation is also going to be important because this is going to start doing things around determining who the other customer is in the services market. To an extent, and uh, if we take Future Music Festival back in the day, Australia used to have a lot better music festival options and opportunities. But Future Music Festival back in the day ran three sets of tickets. There were basically generic punter class, uh, 120. There was a slightly upscale class, 150, shorter queues on the way in. And there was VIP class, which was 200. The VIP class had VIP tents. Beside each of the VIP, each of the main stages was a VIP area which had a dedicated bar, dedicated seating area, and an okay view of the stage. However, the VIP could elect to leave the VIP section and go hang out in the main stage, in the main crowd. If you wanted to be in the center of the mosh pit up by um, the speaker stack and you bought your $200 VIP ticket, you had access all areas to the other market segments. The cheaper tickets couldn't come into your segment, but the more expensive segments could go out to the cheaper tickets area. It made a pricing segmentation work and was worthwhile because it provided an additional feature for each level of additional uh, financial outlay, you're getting a better value back. All right, let's talk about how to price a service. Let's talk strategies. If you've done intro to marketing, you should know that there are some basic price strategies like price skimming, price penetration, prestige pricing. We're gonna talk about a couple of different services pricing elements here. Satisfaction-based pricing. Um, look, this only works if you can put the price up as people are more satisfied, uh, but that's dangerously close to bringing in factors like tipping and tipping is a terrible thing should never be encouraged. Uh, relationship pricing is where you're going to use your uh, your idea that there's going to be a long-term transaction here. Uh, so a bit of price bundling, a bit of long-term contract, a bit of assumption that you'll, if you're doing a one-off event that you'll pay a higher, um, you'll pay a higher price for a one-off transaction because there's a lot of setup costs involved for the organization, for you as the provider, but the longer the relationship goes, the more likely it is that you're going to get the co-creation, you'll get the value, both parties will have uh, reduced costs in terms of maintaining the relationship because of the experience that they have in providing service and receiving service. Uh, there's efficiency-based pricing, which is a terrible decision, please do not do it. Efficiency-based pricing says that the better you are at your job, the less you can charge someone, which is a terrible life choice. Skip it. Uh, temporary pricing, adaptive pricing, flat rate, oh, different rates, surge charges. There are surge charges, discounts. The whole idea of the whatif.com was it came from this thing called lastminute.com. 
which was hotels trying to offload their excess stock because a room that's not used is a room that has perished so you're better off getting slightly more than it costs to clean the room as the the here's the key room cleaning costs a certain amount of money so for every hotel room that's used that is a cost the hotel incurs now if you are going to automatically clean every hotel room irrespective of its use then you're going to incur that whether someone used the room or not so what you need to do is set your price so that you're at least covering the cost of the cleaning services and that becomes your minimum rate you have a higher rate because you want to aim pay the staff, pay the bills, maintain the building, turn a profit, but you then have a last minute, a minimum rack rate you're prepared to let the room go for because you're going to lose money on it if it's empty, so you might as well not lose money on it if you can fill it with slightly more than it costs. So that's the idea of the original sort of last minute dot com, last minute pricing. Uh, it's now just what if and last minute are just brokers now. They're just like a standard brokerage service. Uh, there are no, there are very few logging onto the website at, um, you know, logging onto a hotel website at five in the afternoon to find out if it's got space uh, for the overnight. There's, that sort of behaviour isn't present or prevalent anymore because they've gotten really good at all the other pricing strategies and the predictive things and demand management and demand surge control all right a couple of things um, pricing and customer considerations again price is an informational cue price is a feature price will help you understand what you should expect now I put up the um, price range here for uh, the Siam sensors massage place that's right next to uh, the bus stop for the the interstate coaches because its pricing structure is magnificent 30 minutes so it's got time-based pricing 30 60 90 120 75 105 25 so it kind of as soon as you bring um, heated rocks into it, things go strange. But until that point, you can pretty much see, start working out what are the differences and how the differences apply. They apply around what element of the actual product changes between the different aspects. So if you throw in a, let's pick the lowest price option on here for the longest time, Traditional massage, 150 bucks, 120 minutes. Throw in a hot oil treatment, it goes up by 10. Throw in the aromatherapy, it's gone up by 10. The coconuts, 10. Milk, 10. You're starting to see a pattern. So, a price bundle. But also, this is a cue. This tells you that, you know, I really want to treat myself. 200 bucks buys you a bunch of rocks. Um, yeah. You get a massage and a bunch of rocks put on you. I don't think I sell massages anywhere near as hot well, rock massages is anywhere near the value, but two hundred bucks cause you're worth it. Two hours worth of stuff taking place. And here's the thing: this is a high search attribute product. It's a high. It's actually a strangely uh, high consistency product because the sequence is going to be the same. The interaction with the customer will vary, and you'll note that they have got a little uh, data points here in terms of pressure level, sensations to expect. This is a search attribute. There's also details as to what's going to take place and further information. It's search attribute driven pricing. Coming down to competitive, uh, comparing and contrasting services is difficult because there's always a self-service option as a competitive alternative. I've got in here a hairdressing salon because they're fantastic for pricing and really hard to do competitive based pricing. So here we have a haircut that comes to you. 
Now that also anything I've said about uh, inseparability and haircuts, they are inseparable, but they can be separated from the service scape, as is being demonstrated here. I was kind of like the idea of that you know you'd have a mobile hairdressing service that was basically a salon and a van. I think that'd be quite entertaining. But you've got a price list. Uh, but then one of the things on this price list is the idea of shampoo, blow dry, and set. Basically, do someone doing your hair for you in a way that you could self-service at home. Fifty-five bucks versus not fifty-five bucks. So. There is a competitive consideration, even this mobile hairdressing price tag, of it could be DIY. It could be beaten by a DIY offer. Now, profit considerations are... Services marketing has a great opportunity to run profit because you can run a service with much lower overheads. You can start services up because they're skill-based with much less physical plant, physical manufacturing. But you also have costs that you may, there are hidden costs that you may not be factoring in in terms of your overheads and your budgets, so it can be a little tough. Now, profit based pricing as well, though, it should be that individual prices in the, in the bundle of services may be hard to separate. In this case, we're going to talk about um, a, a local restaurant that's got an okay pricing scheme. But you look at these two products here. This is the lunch. $66 for the lunch. Now, a mission critical thing here in this is you can't unbundle. You can work out now the sides cost nine bucks extra. So you can take your 66 to more than 66. Well, I'll throw a cheese board on the back there, that takes you up to 88. But each of these artifacts in here, with the exception of the sides and the cheese board, can't be easily separated out. So this provides you with a moment of, okay, how much is each element? They're all bundled together, you can't separate them out, you don't know, you know they might be making an absolute killing on the cheese platter. It might be costing them two bucks to put together and they're getting it away for 20. They might be losing money on the entrees, but the entrees are the hook that gets you to buy the mains, so it's worth it. But across the bundle, it all works out. One thing that does occur with this pricing, though, is that there's a little bit of a price problem when we raise, when we bring up the wine list. I'd like to just quickly show you the, uh, the wine list here. So, your standard price here, something out of the Canberra region, 68 bucks for a bottle. So, if you come in for lunch, you could pay more for your bottle that goes with your lunch than you did for your lunch. If you come in for dinner and you want to crack open a couple of fancy ones to celebrate, you're going to rack up a greater expense on the drinks. Now, yeah, I'm in the champagne section, I know. Then you're going to on the dinner menu. So the question I ask is, if you've got a $2,000 bottle, or even a $300 bottle, or a $5,000 bottle, is the lunch and the dinner priced correctly? Is it a comparable price? Is this price package the kind of person who's going to rock in and go, Garçon, the 93 thanks, and lay down a smooth 5k, Is that person going to be attracted by an $88 a head four course meal? So your market segments, your, seg your price sensitivity, they've got these options on the deck here, but are they being facilitated and supported by the rest of the pricing structure? Is this a comprehensive, is this a comprehensive and compatible bundle? So whilst on the surface I could be, I could be seen as criticising the price at $88 for being expensive, I actually think it's a factor well below. I think uh, the four course dinner menu should be around $400 to $500. So if you're going to be pushing a wine list or a champagne list like this, you want four to $500 a head. You want people dropping a couple of K a piece. 
because that's the kind of market that's not going to blink at doing $300 a bottle and multiple bottles. So you want to make certain that your prices are always internally consistent. Now on the product um, consideration, there's also um, a couple of things here about uh, because services are intangible, customers can't stockpile them, so that's a pro to service pricing. The con is that the more complicated you make the product, the well, the pro and con. The pro is that you can clearly identify your markets. The con is your market's starting to figure out where, who am I, where do I fit? Uh, is my website hosting company that I've been on the webmaster package for however many years I've been with them now fits all the things I want and need but I've never had a reason to go up to business so on the webmaster 50 accounts 21 domain names mostly the same mostly the same don't need the rest of it so there is but if you're a starter it's like just getting up getting going two domain names six bucks a month seven bucks a month double that and you're at 21 domain names so there's also sort of sliding scales of how do the uh, how do these things work in terms of the sliding scales one five ten no limit there, there are certain things like that that when you're starting to do price bundling, there's a certain point of economy of scale in the service delivery that you've got to be uh, thinking of for the customer. At what point does it get ridiculous? It's like, technically at the moment on the hosting package I've got, I could have far too many email accounts. And the thing I like here is that I can only host my own accounts and I can't provide hosting for third parties, but I can have 200 of my own email addresses. Not entirely certain one. Okay, I've got an idea what I can do with 200 email addresses, but that's not the point. As an individual purchasing this, some of these features aren't going to be of use to me, but I can't trade them out because they're price bundled. Uh, legal considerations in pricing. Honesty and integrity are important in services marketing. Uh, particularly, this is one of the reasons why Cashy's up here because it's run as an, I know the guy who runs it and it's was set up because there was a lot of non, uh, how should we say, there was a lot of interesting pricing structures that were taking place and particularly multiple bill, billing times of a mechanic who would be billing an hour for working on a car for the four cars that were in the garage were each being billed the hour and he was spending 15 minutes on each of them. So technically he was working for an hour. He just wasn't working for an hour for your car. He was working for an hour for the firm and they were billing all four cars at the hourly rate. Consequently, this mechanic service came up on the grounds of mechanic, home mechanics and servicing and mechanical servicing can be high in credence. If you don't know much about your cars, you don't know whether you've got a good service or a bad service. If you do know about the cars and it's being done at your home and you get to sit around the place talking to the mechanic, watching the mechanic do the work, it's experiential. And if you know basically specifically what you need done, it's search because you can just call up and say, hey, need a mechanic to do X, Y, Z. Come over, get it done. So the idea here is that the more search-based prices are easier to compare so they are less vulnerable to uh, unethical practice. Credence is very vulnerable to unethical practice because even if you get a good price and a good service, you don't know if you got a good outcome. Let's talk about how to price a service. Closing, heading towards the close. We have two pricing calculators here. This is financial pricing a service. And this is an important facet that I really want people to understand is that when we talk about pricing a service, we are talking about the financial price that you incur. Let's see how it's going to play nicely for lighting. So these again, we're talking at the hourly rates. Uh, this particular 
element, here's your equation. What's your hourly rate? What's your billable? Fixed price, pop up advert, perceived value. All of these elements here, there is an actual calculation here of what do you need to do to run, to set your price. Uh, one of the ones that I am quite fond of in terms of the service pricing is to work out how much it is you want to earn in a given time period. So how much do you want to earn in a year? Divide that up by the number of weeks you're prepared to work. Divide that by the number of days of the week that you want to work. Work out how much you need to charge for each one of your days. Then work out how many times your trade-off needs to take place. So here we have the Queensland Government website with the actual costing thing here of, okay, around $1,700, 50% markup, that's what it's going to cost. It'll cost me 2500 to deliver this workshop uh, for flights, travel, accommodation, everything else. 50% markup says so minimum price I can ask is 30, 375 so this particular calculator is very good for being able to work out and this lets us do the charge for hours. So standard academic working week, 60 hours, 90 hour days, because we're really bad at this. Um, our union needs worse with us. Days off, sick leave miscellaneous, yep. Annual expenses and overheads, uh, profit you'd like for the year, so look, Let's be honest here, being an academic ain't, academic ain't, ain't, cheap, ain't easy. And let's say we want to be real about that. The other thing is, you, I'm wondering whether you can actually reverse engineer it. No, you can't. Uh, so your pricing. Here you can actually calculate some hours and some numbers and what it is you want to do. So what is it going to get you? And so there's a couple of uh, pricing calculators. There are also the government, the Queensland government's really big on people having uh, success. So they do also include some basic things around pricing strategies. Skimming, penetration, image, discount, loss leader. So welcome to, um, welcome to the fact that the government supports small businesses to do small business things. All right, final thing to recap. Pricing is difficult because price also at this point I need you to have in mind that you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle to make the price decision pricing draws on the rest of the mix pricing is a signal of value so it influences branding positioning and integrated marketing communication it also loops around as a means by which people set their expectations based on your price, so it influences the perception of the service, the expectations of the service, how people perceive it, so it influences the product. Price can also be determined in, can be a determinant around who are the other customers in the process, so it influences people. And price can also do things with regards to distribution in terms of reducing or increasing access to the service. So price influences the whole of the mix and is influenced by the mix. But also price fundamentally is the thing that keeps the company alive. Product is the reason people will come to you. The value offer is the reason people come to you. Price is the reason that you can keep going and offering that value back to the market. You have to price high enough there's an ethical and moral obligation that if you are in the business of solving a problem for someone as a service, you have an ethical and moral obligation to stay in business to continue being the solution to that problem. If you underprice yourself and you go out of business, then you have let down your customer who is depending on you as the solution to the problem. So good pricing is moral pricing is ethical pricing. Pricing that allows you to stay in business is an ethical and moral pricing, which means profit is a thing that you need to do in reasoned and reasonable measure so that you can continue operating your organization.